with that, let us get prepared for the next talk by uh, Matea Sazo, if I pronounced that correctly, Searching for Dyson Spheres with Gaia and Wise. Okay, so hello everybody. My name is Matias Suazo. <laughs> I am a first year PhD student in astronomy at Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, but I'm new in the field of SETI, but I'm looking forward to learning more about like, the field. Um, today I'm going to present my first project for my PhD, what is about uh, assessing upper limits on the prevalence of Dyson spheres in the Milky Way using uh, Gaia and WISE. Oops. But before I talk about like uh, my project itself, I think I should uh, recall some few concepts. I know that you probably know them all, but I think it's very educational to refresh them. The first one being the, the notion of the Dyson sphere. We know that in the 60s, Freeman Dyson uh, theorized that any civilization that had existed for millions of years could be in the need of creating a megastructure to, to collect the energy from their host star. He also made some calculations to estimate the time scale for this industrial expansion, and he got a number of 3,000 years, roughly, which is very short, short if we compare it with star lifetimes. However, uh, Dyson's original idea was very vague. He talked about like an artificial biosphere surrounding the, the star. However, we know that a monolithic, a monolithic uh, sphere would be mechanically unstable. So different variations of this scheme have been proposed. And here we have a few of them. We have the Dyson ring, we have the Dyson swarm, and we have a Dyson bubble. But regardless of the structure we are talking about, their potential uh, signatures would be the same. First of all, we have to recall that whatever happens in a Dyson sphere is going to be a thermodynamic process. And as in any thermodynamic process, this capture of uh, this harvest of energy is going to imply some waste heat to be released to the space. Also, uh, the structure would partially block some of the store light, so the second signature could be a drop in the optical flux. Finally, we have a another signature, a time variable flux. But this is very dependent on the, the kind of the structure, the nature of the structure. Another concept that we have to keep in mind is the age informalism that was described by Wright et al. 2014. This is actually, uh, in this paper, it's described this balanced energy equation applied to, to, the, to, uh, to the aliens energy budget and is summarized in this, in this equation. In the left-hand side, we have alpha, that stands for radiation collected by the ice here, and epsilon, that stands for the energy produced by other means. So the left-hand side is the collected energy, while in the right-hand side, we have the disposal energy. Uh, gamma is the waste heat, while nu are other loses like neutrinos or gravitational waves. So after giving you this bunch of information, I would like to recall again that that the goal of this project is to estimate upper limits on the prevalence of Dyson spheres in the Milky Way. So then we can proceed to talk about Dyson sphere models. Uh, however, we have to make some assumptions, and here we have them. The standard assumptions is that they are gray absorbers, then that in this energy balance equation, alpha and gamma are equal. That means that the radiation collected by Dyson sphere and the waste heat are going to be the same, or what comes is left, and also that this waste heat can be modeled as a black body with a temperature in the range of 100 and 1000 Kelvin. Also for the sake of simplicity, I have redefined the gamma value for this expression is just the energy of the Dyson sphere normalized by the stellar energy before it is obscure, and I call it uh, the coding factor as well. So with these assumptions, it turns out that to model a Dyson sphere, we just need two parameters, the temperature, and the gamma, the covering factor. So then we can apply the model to any spectrum. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to do it to this very simple black body spectrum for, uh, for a solar type object. That means a temperature of 5,800 Kelvin and a volumetric luminosity of one solar luminosity. And then we apply the model. Well, here we apply three models and we get this new spectra. In this case, the three models are, uh, are our Dyson sphere with a temperatures of 300 Kelvin, but different coding factors. And you can see that we recover two signatures. One is the drop in the optical flux, and the other one is the boost in the mid-infrared. 
we can also apply models with uh, a fixed covering factor, in this case 0.5 and different temperatures. But in this picture, I would like you, in this image, I would like you to, to keep in mind that it is important is that the, the mid infrared boost falls in the detectability region of the WISE mission. So now I can proceed to talk about like the strategy and the data. So since it's important to, to count on very good optical data and mid infrared data, I've been using Gaia data release to data that provides parallaxes, distances, positions, proper motions, as well as three broadband uh, magnitudes for roughly 10 to the nine objects and always data that provides uh, maybe infrared photometry for roughly 7.5 times 10 to the eight objects. So when we combine this data, we end up with the relevant data for roughly uh, 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight Milky Way stars. So then to estimate the numbers, we use the color magnitude diagram, but as a first approach, I'm just taking into account stars within 100 parsecs in the local bubble, because these stars uh, for these stars, we can ignore the interstellar extinction. And the data sample contains this number of stars, 260,000 uh, 260, stars. And we are checking their color magnitude diagrams. Here we have uh, color magnitude diagrams with a uh, G absolute magnitude on the Y axis and G minus absolute three on the X axis. And the gray dots are the stars in the sample while the yellow and the red star or the Sun and Proxima Centauri respectively. And we can see how different Dyson SVU model change their position in their color magnitude diagram. We can see here uh, models for a fixed uh, temperature, which is 300 at different covering factors. And here we can see uh, how they change for a fixed covering factor of 0.5 and different temperatures. The point here is you will have a color excess. Then I have proceeded to apply the model of a Dyson sphere to all the stars in the sample. So we have the stars in the sample here, these gray dots, and we have the, the, the models, the, these models. And then I proceeded to define this line called the position boundary. I will not depend on the creation of this, but you can ask later. And we say that all the stars, all the sources, so sorry, all the sources that are in this region, in the right hand side region of the a Hertz-Russell diagram are objects compatible with a Dyson sphere with a temperature of this case, in this case of 300 Kelvin and a coding factor higher than 0.95 in this case. So then we count the number of stars and we say, okay, we have this number of stars consistent with a Dyson sphere. However, we don't do this only with the G minus W3 color in the on, in the x-axis of this Hertz-Russell diagram. We also do it with a G minus W4 color. And we require for a star to be consistent with a Dyson sphere if it has an excess in both the G minus W3 and G minus W4 color. So in this particular example, we say that we have nine objects that are consistent with this uh, Dyson sphere, 300 Kelvin, and a covering factor of 0.95, uh, for whose fraction is this value, 3.4 times 10 to the minus five, roughly. So then we, we did exactly the same for a huge range of covering factors and temperatures of isonospheres. And we gather all this information in this plot called the exclusion map. In this plot, the X axis, in the, uh, on the X axis, we have the temperature of the isonosphere and we have the covering factor on the uh, Y axis. So, and the color represents the, the fraction that are consistent with this type of isonosphere. You can see that for low covering factors, the fraction is very close to one. And that happens because to have a low covering factor is equivalent to have a transparent Dyson sphere and all the stars are compatible with transparent Dyson spheres. Also, uh, when we have very cold stars, also the fraction is the same, it's close to one, but that happens because when we have very, very cold um, Dyson sphere models, um, the radiation falls in the far infrared and and is not in the detectability region of the wise bands. However, we got very interesting limits in this region for covering factors between 0.1 and above and temperatures between 100 and 600 Kelvin. Then I proceeded to apply, to do exactly the same by, but extending now the sample to a stars within 200 parsecs. In this case, the sample contains roughly 2 million stars, which is a lot. And this is the exclusion map we get, the same as before, we get a huge fraction for 
very cold hot uh, Dyson spheres and huge fractions for um, low coverage. And we also have a, a tiny fraction in this region, in this particular region. However, now we have too many stars and too many candidates that are consistent with um, Dyson spheres. So we decided to, to use complementary data. In this case, we used two mass data and we reduced the sample from roughly 2 million to 1.5 times. Uh, times 10 to the 6 stars and we included a new condition for Gaia and Weiss we said that the condition is to have an excess in G minus W3 and G minus W4 color but now we added the condition of not having the sources or the candidates uh, excess in the near infrared and we end up with this new um, exclusion map and actually similar to the previous one but um, the positions of, the, of these um, limits are like uh, shifted by the order one by one order of magnitude then i proceeded to check what kind of sources we have in this in this region for this uh, that are consistent with this dyson sphere in the for this uh, range of temperatures and this range of covering factors and here we have a few examples most of them are actually stars and live in nebula regions and that's the reason why they have medium infrared excess also, we found some ghosts <laughs> um, that are due to like uh, diffractions in the camera. And also we found some natural like sources of medium infrared emission like the Tauri stars and cataclysmic variables. So that would be all for the moment. But instead of having a conclusion slide, I would like to mention like the future world that I intended to do. First, this uh, work wants to cover all the stars in the all and uh, Gaia release to an or by sample. That means this number uh, between 10 to the seven and 10 to the eight objects. We also plan to, to improve the upper limits by including the G minus W2 and G minus W1 uh, colors. And once we have all the candidates, all the sources consistent with a specific uh, type of Dyson sphere, we plan to release a candidate list. And also we plan to check the nature of the candidates by uh, looking for auxiliary data on other databases. So that would be all. So thank you very much.